blessings. Good evening to you all. It's Tuesday night, so uh, that means we have some questions with some answers. So, first question. Does music have a role to play in the practice of Dhamma? And can you enter Samadhi while playing or listening to music? And this is quite a commonly asked question. I seem to remember when Lumpur Cha was in England, they asked him this question. And he smiled. I think their question was, uh, "Can you?" Uh, that the somebody played music, and they reckon they were entering jhana when they played music. And he smiled and said, "They're only entering jhana in their imagination." Sometimes Ajahn Chah could be quite direct in his answers. And the way the Buddha described uh, this human realm we live in. We have a human form, we have senses, we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, sense of touch, and then the mind that knows things. So it's a, we call it a sensual realm, gama loka, sensual realm. And the objects of our senses are enticing, Fascinating, give rise to desire, for and against. So pleasant objects we like, we want, we want more of, we absorb into. Unpleasant objects we react with aversion and want to get rid of and end. So music is obviously something that many people find enticing. I used to play music and listen to music for my for about 10 years before I was a monk so I was um, I, f I found much pleasure in music like many other people so it's, it's definitely part of the world isn't it uh, obviously it's a very commercial thing as well but just the the desire for the pleasure, the relaxation, the various emotions, coarse and refined, that can arise by listening and playing music, um, a part of human culture. Even in the time of the Buddha, they had plenty of music and it wasn't unknown for people to compose songs, poems and songs and play them in praise of the Buddha. Occasionally even, I think, in front of the Buddha. And nowadays in Buddhist countries you sometimes have Buddhist festivals and ceremonies where music and traditional music and traditional dancing becomes part of the ceremony, the festival. The Buddha even said there are heaven realms full of musicians who play their lutes and their harps in praise of the Buddha and the Arahants. And in, in, say in Thailand, when I used to live in Thailand, people would compose songs about Arahants, even very kind of highly respected meditation masters. They'd compose songs and play them and you'd hear them on the radio. <laughs> so, music and Buddhism is certainly not, they're not alien to each other. But music form lies within the realm of sensuality. It's sound, and then the emotions and the pleasure that is stimulated from that, those sounds, the melodies and everything, the whole world of music. It's stimulating, it can give rise to great joy, different emotions, and that's one of the attractions. You know, it draws out our emotions, we can become 
They can enhance, it can enhance our emotions. So you have a soundtrack on a movie, don't you, to enhance the, the sense of uh, sadness or happiness. Or if it's a thriller, they have sort of music that gets you on your edge, the edge of your seat. Um, so music enhances the emotions. But in that sense, it's <coughs> within the realm of sensuality, it can be very much a cause for what we call craving and clinging, dana upadana. We attach to the pleasure, the emotions, if we're not very mindful. Um, and that's pretty much automatic and it doesn't lead on, you know, the relaxation and the happiness you get from listening and playing music doesn't lead on to insight. It doesn't naturally lead on to insight. It leads to suffering because there'll be times when you don't feel high from the music that you used to feel high from. Hence the pop music industry, always producing new songs, new acts, because we get bored with the old ones even classical music, jazz, whatever, people get bored with music. They get used to it, so they don't get the same level of pleasure over and over again. So they look for new music all the time. And then after a while they go back to the original stuff because they've, got, you know, they've forgotten about it. And that's the nature of the sensual realm. It gives you temporary pleasure. It's absorbing, so it does relax you, takes you out of your body, as it were, takes you out of your stress, your suffering, and people will use it, and they often call it meditation music even. But this is not the same as samadhi, or certainly not the same as sama samadhi, as described by the Buddha. It can give you this sense of relaxation, but it will doesn't lead to insight into the true nature of this body and this mind and the world. It doesn't lead on to seeing the impermanence and the unsatisfactoriness and the selfless nature of phenomena. And that's the limitation of, of music. So it's not to say that you can't gain pleasure, even what we call pity and sukha, rapture and happiness from music, just as you could from art or literature or sport, you know, all of these different activities and including sexual activity can give rise to different forms of joy, rapture. But this is the mind that is bound up with sensuality, craving and clinging. Samadhi, sama samadhi when practice is the stillness of mind, the one pointed unified mind that's been developed on the back of sila, right, skillful action, skillful, skillful conduct, um, right effort, right mindfulness, in the mind unifying in the samadhi with the qualities of piti and sukha, one-pointedness. But this is different from the pleasure of absorbing into, say, music. One thing, it's not dependent on any external object. It's, the mind is turning inwards to know itself and be one pointed on itself. And it's the basis for developing insight. And so when you experience a state of calm, un unified mind, of the unified mind of samadhi, then to turn to contemplate the impermanence of your own five khandhas, body, feelings, emotions, thoughts, sense consciousness. Um, one can do it very well. Whereas my experience from music is it doesn't lead to insight. It, you know, it might, might relax you and that can have a use, use, a use in its place, but it also leads to disappointment, attachment, clinging, and you have to admit suffering. So, 
Another question. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your kindness. I would like to introduce the Buddha's teachings and meditation to my father. I found my father deeply loves my family and everything he has. He has a fear of losing. When he faces my mum and I was sick, he had to do everything he could, but he didn't take care of his own mental health and hide his feelings. He doesn't want to talk about death or how to find peace of mind. Could you please give me some advice with Metta? Well, as we know, the Buddha encouraged children to give something back to the parents and give something back means on the material level, looking after their health and well-being materially, especially as they get older, retire, maybe get sick, weak, but also to look after their spiritual well-being. And one of the greatest gifts you can give to your parents is to support them in their Dhamma practice and to get them established in faith in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, get them established in right view where they understand the value of making good karma and uh, abandoning or avoiding making bad karma in their life. And particularly, you know, developing right view comes from listening to Dhamma and associating with wise, good people. So this is something that we can l look to do, look for ways to get our parents, say in this case father, to listen to Dhamma or read Dhamma, talk Dhamma, discuss Dhamma. So if there's any way you can get him to um, listen to the Dhamma, you know, online or read Dhamma books or you could read Dhamma books to him, if you can, or, or get him to a, a monastery or a retreat, a meditation retreat, to hear Dhamma and then practice Dhamma. That might be a goal that you could set up. And it will depend on his own karma, his own character, personality, how he responds, how easy or hard that is. One thing often people are surprised that their parents are often more open to Dhamma than they realize. We go through our life often we develop very fixed views and perceptions about our parents and people come to me saying they talk and they say, oh, there's no way my mom, my dad is gonna understand the Dhamma, what can I do? Well, we can only try and often they can understand quite a lot of Dhamma because any parent will have develop all kinds of good qualities in helping their family, earning a living, living in the world. They'll have a store of intelligence. They'll know how to sacrifice for others if they've had kids and a family. They'll have all kinds of good qualities like kindness, generosity. Um, and often their children underestimate them. <laughs> often we underestimate parents because of our own bias that we built up through our life. So give it a go, do what you can to get them to hear the Dhamma. If you can, take them somewhere where they can hear the Dhamma, practice Dhamma, make offerings, meet Sangha is a really good thing. But you also can use your own practice of Dhamma. I assume you're meditating, listening to Dhamma as well yourself. And then you can look into ways to be creative in getting them to reflect on the Dhamma. So Dhamma themes, like you say, he doesn't want to talk about death. My mother was like that for many years. She wouldn't talk about death. She cut off the subject. But um, just taking her to Buddhist monasteries, getting, getting her to go on retreats, learning the technique of meditation, breathing meditation, reflecting on impermanence, Gradually, she's, my mother started opening up to discussions of death. In the end, she was going on retreats on 
death and dying quite happily. <laughs> the, so these, these, we can get our parents to open up to the Dhamma, we just have to keep working on it. And contemplating impermanence is a really good, useful, insightful reflection that we can, that will lead into con uh, preparing oneself for the end of life, aging, sickness and death. You know, this world is impermanent and there are many, many ways we can help them to see and, and reflect on that every day because everything's impermanent, isn't it? Our moods and thoughts and feelings and emotions are impermanent, they're always changing. Finding skillful ways to get them to reflect and see their own mind and the changing nature of their mind. The physical body changes as we age getting them to see that. Pointing out when other people that we know die, just reflecting on the impermanence of life in whatever way you can, getting them to look at that universal truth that you know, just as this person we know has died, I must die. All of us have to face death. Um, so whatever skillful way you can to introduce the theme of impermanence in the, into just daily conversation, daily reflection, the changing nature of the world uh, over time seems to be very fertile ground for wisdom and insight to arise and people start to opening up to talking about and looking at the truth. And of course any form of meditation that will help them to develop a little more mindfulness, calm themselves down, de develop some stillness. So any meditation technique, whether it's chanting, breath meditation, the meditation on the theme of loving kindness or compassion, you know, trying to get them to the point where they can try that will be very, very beneficial. So being very patient, encouraging, positive to your parents. Um, as I said, we often underestimate their abilities and we have to try, probably have to try a bit harder to get them to try to, to meditate and listen to Dhamma as much as you can. Remember when Ajahn Anand's mother was staying in the monastery and she got ill, went to the hospital. Ajahn Anand just filled the hospital with monks chanting and meditating for his mum. After that, oh, she had lots of faith to listen to Dhamma and meditate because she really saw the value of it. All these monks sending their good vibes to her, meditating and chanting, filling the whole hospital breaking all the hospital rules, going into the ICU unit, <laughs> the room when we shouldn't have been, but the doctors were very kind and let us in. And whatever you can do to get your parents closer to the Dhamma will be of great benefit to them and to you as well. Another question. How do we cultivate gratitude towards parents when annoyance is the dominant emotion we feel. Mm. Yeah, I used to be like that, always getting annoyed with my parents. For me, it changed when I started meditating and I saw how unpleasant it was always being angry with parents and realized how much good they'd done and how little I appreciated them. So that, that was one of my first insights and it came up very quickly as soon as I started meditating regularly. And I said, mentioned this a few times. After meditating just a few times, I had such a feeling of gratitude come up towards my parents. I went to find my mum. Just went up and hugged her and said, thank you, mum. And she looked at me shocked and said, what, what do you want? <laughs> she thought I was doing it to get something. But it wasn't. I just wanted to say thank you because I realized I hadn't done that much in my life. So when you practice meditation, it kind of 
opens you up, doesn't it? You become much more sensitive to yourself, to others, particularly those who have helped you. So just accept it. If you have built up a lot of annoyance to your parents, it's a very normal thing, isn't it, in this world? Especially in the Western culture, we're just so full of negativity, self-hatred, of hatred to others. It's just part of our psyche. And it probably goes hand in hand. If you're annoyed with your mum or your dad or both, you're probably annoyed with yourself as well. And it's just this habitual, critical mind, critical of ourselves, of parents. Often we have very high ideals and our parents don't meet those ideals, so we blame them easily and it becomes kind of a fixed, again, this fixed perception leading to kind of habitual negativity. Um, so you have to work to go against the flow of that. So you have to work to bring up the kindness, the compassion, the tolerance, the sensitivity. Um, you know, whatever you feel towards your parents, you disagree with everything they say. Um, you know, you, that's quite understandable, isn't it? They're from a different generation, different era than us, different background, different personality. There may well be all kinds of differences that you really can't, ex and you can't expect them to change very much because they're much older than you. But what you can do is change your own attitude, meaning you don't have to necessarily agree with them or even like them, but you recognize the good in them. You have to look for the good in them, recognize the good they've done for you, for any other siblings, for your family, and in their lives. Just focus on the good and keep doing that until you see the, see the good in them as the first thing you see when you look at them or think of them. Rather than thinking what's wrong, you think what's right then the negativity will drop into second place. And it may still be there lurking in the background and come up sometimes, but it won't have much power over your mind. You have to work to readdress that balance until your mind is just normal and you can look at things in a balanced way. And what we call the Brahma Viharas, these four sublime abidings come up. So you have kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy or altruistic joy for them, but also upeka. So sometimes our parents will make mistakes or create their own suffering or sometimes they're ill. You have to have a store of upeka, equanimity as well, to deal with that. Understand that they have their own karma just as we have our own karma. Uh, but as well as uh, meeting and, and engaging with them with kindness and compassion, we also have to have the store of equanimity for when things are going badly, so especially at the end of their life, when they're ill, they're old, um, to counteract any feelings of sadness. And that's quite often catches people unawares. They spend a life being annoyed and arguing with their mum or their dad, and then towards the end when they're about to, close to death, then suddenly all this sadness and grief arises and um, you know they don't know how to deal with it because they've been so focused on the aversion for so long. So better to start the process of uh, letting go of your anger now, bringing up the goodwill and the tolerance and seeing the good in your parents now. So when the end comes, when you finally separate from them, I mean maybe you'll die before them, but more likely is they'll die before you. You're ready for it. You're ready to deal with the grief and the sadness and appreciate all the good they did for you and others. You know, the mind that is in a state of normality can do that. But as the Buddha pointed out, we build up biases in our behavior, mental behavior through our lives. So we biases based on love and greed, based on anger, based on fear delusion and it is quite common that we build up um, habitual aversion for parents and it's a real obstacle for our own spiritual development and for good relations with them and it can come up in so many areas of our life blocking us we can, people 
find it very difficult to accept sometimes authority or other people it can come up in your own relationship, your own relationships the, the aversion we built up to our parents stored up in our mind just keeps coming up to be an obstacle in doing good, it will come up in meditation and as I think probably whoever asked this question has found you're meditating and you want to develop loving kindness to your parents but all you can think of is how angry, angry you are with them and you've got to work on it otherwise it's an endless blockage in your development it's just toxic isn't it because our parents have been have done so much good for us whether we recognize it or not if you turn against them then you're turning against something very good so in the terms of karma, the heaviness, the weightiness of karma, you, you probably heard there's these five weighty, heavy karmas that a human being can make. One of them is to try and kill a Buddha, or draw blood from a Buddha, to actually kill an arahant, uh, to split a sangha of monks that are in uh, concord, uh, and to kill one's mother or to kill one's father. And these are the heaviest kinds of karma that human beings can make. So you may well not actually kill your parents, but you might think of it if you're really angry or certainly you might have a lot of aversion for your parents. That's quite a heavy state of mind that will keep bringing you suffering. It will agitate your mind, make it very hard for your mind to settle down into samadhi, to develop clear insight. So you really want to address it as quickly as possible and get back to this state of normality where you can just accept your parents for who they are, develop compassion for them, sensitivity, kindness towards them and just tolerate them. It's an important part of the practice. Another question. Lumpur, my understanding is such. As the Buddha has passed into Parinibbana, we need the worthy ones as the guides to understand the Vinaya and the Dhamma to lead us to walk along the Eightfold Noble Path for the cessation of suffering. We have to be grateful to the worthy ones, just like our parents. They have brought us to this earth so that we can use this body and mind to cultivate until final liberation is realized. Hence, we have to respect and venerate the worthy ones, like our parents. Is this correct understanding? I assume the worthy ones, you mean the noble ones, as in the uh, enlightened ones, the different, those people who have practiced and realized the four stages of enlightenment, so a stream winner, once returner, non returner, and arahant, fully enlightened arahant. So they are the ones we praise every day when we do our chanting. Supatipano, Bhagavato, Sawaka Sanko, Uju Patipano, Nyaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. Uh, so the Arya, what we call the Arya Pugala, the noble ones, or you've said the worthy ones. We recollect the qualities of the worthy ones every day. We chant in praise of them, remind ourselves of how they practiced and then aspire to emulate them. So yes, we should um, rec recognize, honor and recollect the qualities of the worthy ones and in a similar way to our parents. This is part of what we call right view, worldly right view or mundane right view where you're recognizing the value of teachers, good practitioners, people who have helped you, parents as well. Um, sticking close to them, associating with the noble ones, those who have practiced well, 
listening to their dharma, respecting their dharma, giving it value in your mind so that then you incline towards it and practice it. When we turn our back on the noble ones, turn our back on good dharma, turn our back on our parents as well, then we're going in, in the wrong direction and we'll probably end up further away from the dharma and our goal of liberation. It's very difficult to be, to develop the Eightfold Noble Path if we don't respect those who have already done it. And this, so you're, when you look at the Noble Ones or recollect the Noble Ones, you're not, it's not a um, competition of personality or you know, it's not celebrities, you know, I like this one, I don't like that one. It's, these are people who have, who embody the Eightfold Noble Path in the way they conduct themselves, they've practiced developing sila, samadhi, panya, they've developed deep insight, realized the Four Noble Truths, penetrated the Four Noble Truths. Um, so they're worthy of praise, worthy of honor and should be recollected as a way to develop the same qualities in yourself. So yes, your understanding does seem correct. The last question. Lumpur, during sitting meditation I contemplate the body, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin and so on. And then I notice or observe that the upper part of the body becomes very soft, then becomes hard, then experiences heat, strong vibrations, trembling, stiffness and turgidity. Then realization arises that these are just characteristics of the four elements. Out of compassion, may I request Lumpur's comment? Simple answer, yes, correct. <laughs> it, these are just characteristics of the four elements because this body is composed of the four elements, earth, air, fire, water. And like you say, when you practice meditation and develop mindfulness, right effort, abandoning negative mental states, what we call the five hindrances, and cultivating skillful mental states such as mindfulness, wisdom, and experiencing maybe some stillness of mind, peace, happiness. Then um, you will experience the body more clearly. You will be mindful of the sensations in your body, feelings associated with the body, pleasure and pain and neutral feelings. And if you're contemplating the 32 parts of the body running through them and your mindfulness of the body is improving, again, you'll become much more aware of the component parts of the body and then uh, the four elements and it's quite common that people have become much more aware and sensitive to different sensations in the body. So people do feel heat arising where they didn't notice it before, or coolness, cold arising where they didn't notice before. The body can become stiff, it can become very soft, um, as you've been describing. And other, other experiences as well, like you say, trembling, um, People can become very aware of their heartbeat, the breath obviously, sensations in different parts of the body. Um, these are all very normal experiences as the body and mind settle down practicing mindfulness. And because all of this is new and because our mindfulness is still shaky, then it affects us and we become sometimes full of doubt, like what is this I'm experiencing, this trembling or these painful sensations or itching sensations or feelings of heat, cold or stiffness. 
It can give rise to doubt, curiosity, worry, anxiety. Basically agitate the mind. So the general guide is to just keep developing mindfulness and make your mindfulness more consistent and continuous, firmer. Then body and mind will settle down more and a lot of these experiences will just pass by. And they'll arise and pass away again. And you'll know that, you'll see that. You say, oh, before I was trembling or shaking, now that's gone. My body was feeling very hot, now it's settled down. And in Thailand, the teachers will always say, this is just the adjusting of the four elements as you're meditating. You're becoming much more sensitive and aware of your body and these four elements. So you're aware of the breath, you're aware of temperature changes. And the body itself is changing you. So people find through meditation the metabolic rate changes. The breath often becomes very subtle and then often seems to disappear. It's so subtle. The heartbeat, blood pressure may change, calm down, settle down. The body may change from feeling cold to feeling hot or feeling hot to feeling cool. So it is, ultimately you're right, these are characteristics of the four elements and you can contemplate them as such or you can just observe the arising and passing away of these different phenomena and just keep your mindfulness and just keep observing the impermanent changing nature of phenomena. You can also observe the lack of self in phenomena as mindfulness becomes stronger and more continuous you can see the conditioned nature of this body because the very act of meditating, becoming mindful is a conditioning, uh, has a conditioning effect on your body and your mind. You can contemplate that and see this, that there's no self in any of this. It's one thing leading to another. So as mindfulness and samadhi comes up, there are changes in the physical body, changes in the mind different mental qualities arise with samadhi. So, say, what we call vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, eka, kata. So, initial application of mind to a meditation object, of putting your mind on that object, sustaining it, keeping it there. Piti is rapture, and rapture, some of the things you've been describing are probably experiences of rapture, so you sometimes have waves of rapture, tingling sensations, hair standing on end, body seems to fill up as though it's filling up like a balloon or something, sometimes seems to float, sometimes disappears. This is rapture. Um, sukha is happiness, deep, profound feelings of happiness that are independent of the material world or the sensual world. Um, it's internal happiness that really stills and quietens the mind and is very satisfying. There's this feeling of fullness, just like when you've eaten food, you feel full, but you don't actually need food or anything else. It's just an internal fullness of mind. What we call the happy mind, the smiling mind. And then one point it is, this ekakata is the unification of mind. In whatever meditation technique you're using, these factors will be arising and replacing the five hindrances, sense desire, ill will, drowsiness, sloth and torpor, restlessness, anxiety, and then skeptical doubt. These are the five hindrances that will be fading as these other qualities are coming into the mind to replace them. And this is a simple process of cause and effect. You know, we, may, we may deludedly say, this is me, I am experiencing happiness or rapture, or I am experiencing ill will or sense desire. But there's no self in that, it's cause and effect. What your mind is putting its attention on will lead to a result. So if you put your attention on a wholesome object with mindfulness, then these qualities will arise. If you put your attention on with a lack of mindfulness, a lack of wisdom, you might put it on a, an object of aversion or sensual desire or sleepiness. Well, that's the result you're going to get. And really there's no self in that. 
these, this is a process of cause and effect that you're learning to observe and understand through meditation. So yes, these kind of experiences are very normal, don't worry about them, just observe them, uh, try and gain some wisdom from them, but also maintain your mindfulness and you'll find you go through many different experiences um, and a lot of them will pass away and maybe never return. You know, if, as you become more skilled in meditation, things that used to bother you in the beginning fade out and maybe never return. For example, I, I can remember when I first began meditation, I had all kinds of itching sensations. This is very common for meditators. Itchy knees, itchy back, itchy head. And you just keep being tempted to scratch and rub and you wonder why your body itches so much. It's simply you're settling down and becoming aware of the body so that stimulates some itching sometimes. And the more you scratch, the worse it becomes. So you learn not to scratch. You learn to ignore the itching sensation and then it fades away and then it tends not to return. And so you go through your itching phase and then go beyond itching. And you have a little victory and a little bit of success in your meditation. You say, aha, I've got beyond itching. I am no longer bothered by itching. Uh, it could be the various kinds of pain, especially minor aches and pains. You might become mindful of them and then gradually they just don't bother you anymore even though they may still be a, there in your consciousness they just don't bother you and it can be the same with different perceptions of things that irritate you memories that irritate you thoughts that irritate you annoy you worry you as you progress in your meditation you contemplate these things let them go and they no longer return to bother you that's a process of letting go, seeing, observing and letting go. And the more you do it, generally the better you'll get at it. So keep going. So those are the questions for tonight. I hope the answers have given you some something, some encouragement, some help. Uh, and I'll just encourage you to keep practicing meditation. The more you do it, the more regularly you do it, the more patience you have, the more effort you put into it, the more you'll get out of it. That's also cause and effect, isn't it? The more you put into something, the more you get out of it. So please uh, continue with your practice whenever you can. And we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. If the world doesn't fall apart or if our video system doesn't fall apart we'll see you tomorrow and uh, in the meantime may the goodness of Buddha Dhamma Sangha guide you and protect you Thank you